Thousands of years before Columbus reached the New World, a migration of Asiatic nomads moved eastward across the great ice bridge that joined the continents. They were refugees from the bleak plains of Siberia, driven by hunger and the urge to find a new homeland. All but a few moved southward, seeking a gentler climate, a richer, easier life. Those who stayed behind to settle on the harsh Alaskan tundra were a hardy, courageous people and their descendants survive to the present day. They are the Eskimos. Year after year, they fight the elements for the simple necessities of existence. But of all the primitive Americans, they alone have never felt the yoke of conquest. And though they're poor in worldly goods, still strangely enough, they've found riches beyond compare. Their treasure is a way of life. But it's a life that we would find rough and rugged indeed a never-ending struggle against the hardships of the Arctic cold. Yet spring does come, and for a few short months, the Eskimo village is free from winter's grip. A typical Eskimo village is hardly a modern metropolis. There's no corner drugstore here, no theater, not even a post office. But on the other hand, there isn't any jail either. The architecture isn't pretty, but it is practical. Since this is a treeless land, building materials consist entirely of sod and driftwood. And so villages are usually found along the coast, close to nature's lumber yard. When an Eskimo builds a house, he also buries it. For he must anchor his timbers deep in the earth to keep it from blowing away with the first gale of winter. And he doesn't have to buy his lot. He builds where he pleases. He uses no plans, but builds almost by instinct. For Eskimo methods and customs never change. They've been passed down from father to son through countless generations. A good thick layer of earth, firmly packed, and the house is finished. Here it is, home sweet home, complete with northern exposure. Every moment of the short summer season must be used to prepare for the long winter months ahead. Each day is carefully planned, and the building of a whaleboat is a matter of first importance. Eskimos are fine craftsmen. Working with only the crudest of hand tools, they get remarkable results. Walrus hides, carefully stitched together, are used to make the outer covering. This is a job for the women, from young girls to grandmothers. These seams must be absolutely waterproof. The lives of their men will depend on it. Next, the men take over again and lash the covering to the boat frame with rawhide thongs. Only a few finishing touches now, and the boat will be ready for launching. For the children, summertime is mostly playtime. The boys go in for rough, rugged sports kind that builds strong bones and muscles tough as rawhide. For life here is a never-ending test of strength and stamina, even in play. <laughs> the 
The games of the girls are more restrained. They amuse themselves by telling folk tales, which they illustrate on the smooth mud of the beach. The finest sport of all is blanket toss. It's enjoyed by boys and girls alike. Perhaps the best hunter in the village is Koganek. There must be only one shot for one bird. Ammunition is precious, and a miss can mean an empty stomach. His young son, Makaluk, is learning in the school of experience. He's passed all his tests in handling the unpredictable kayak. He even gets an A in cleanliness. As his schooling progresses, he learns the use of weapons, both ancient and modern. Indeed, there are many things a father must teach his son. Koganak has many mouths to feed. Besides his wife, Ananak, and his infant son, Moan, he has a daughter of marriageable age named Pelea as well as three younger girls, Nepesha, Chikoyak, and Niala. The boy baby is always the idol of the household. Sometimes the gathering of winter stores has all the excitement of a treasure hunt. The trick is to find the home of the tundra mouse. He's not the object of the search, but his storehouse is full of tasty nuts and berries. At the trading post, Koganek the hunter goes shopping for the few items he can't produce for himself. Up here, prime furs are the substitute for dollars. And when it comes to making change, poker chips take the place of coin. On the day of the whaler's return, there's much excitement in the village. Everybody lends a hand, for after all, it's everybody's whale. Although the white whale is a relatively small species, still this one weighs about a ton, and that's enough to give every family a good portion. And now for the treat, a nice, tasty chunk of whale skin. It's the Eskimos chewing candy. They call it muck tuck and it has a taste like beech nuts, uh, they say. Anyhow, looks like it's good for the teeth. Every part of the whale will be used. Even the intestines are saved. They supply the Eskimo with a sort of natural plastic for which he has many uses. <laughs> Through the village, winter stores are piling up. But summer is nearly over now, as the last catch of the season goes to the drying racks. The frosty breath of the Arctic sends a foreboding of what's to come. The dogs sense the change. They know that the days ahead will be filled with hardship for dog and master alike. As 
the blizzard sweeps down from the north, only the dogs are left outside to face the bitter blast. This is no thoughtless cruelty. The Eskimo can't afford to pamper his dogs. And exposure to the elements keeps them healthy and fit. And now, Koganik and his family settle themselves for a long winter underground. There'll be few idle hours. Still, there's always time to relax with a good book. Now let's see, what will it be? Bicycles, bonnets, banjos? No, not much here for an Eskimo to get excited about. Wait a minute, here's something more useful. He could certainly use a rifle, some tools, a kerosene lamp, an ice box, ice box. Why, these people have the world's finest deep freeze right in their own living room. Raiding the ice box is an old family custom, for an Eskimo's appetite isn't regulated by the clock. When you're hungry, you eat. This tasty tidbit is raw fish preserved in seal oil. Since meats, fats, and oils build body energy, they're the main items in the Eskimo's diet. The pattern of Koganik's life is an endless circle. In the winter, he makes weapons to use in the summer to provide food for the winter when he makes weapons to use in the summer and so on. His tools are crude, his weapons primitive. Still, Koganik has great faith in these things he carves with his own hands. Indeed, he relies far more on his throwing stick and harpoon than he does on his modern rifle. Elsewhere in the village, Koganik's neighbors find other tasks to fill the long winter months. This woman is using the dried intestines of the whale to fashion a raincoat. Strands of grass are stitched into the seams, making them completely waterproof. The men in the village are masters of all trades. Broken dishes are no problem here, for a bowl carved from driftwood is almost bound to wear well. This man takes time out to indulge in his favorite hobby, ivory carving. Koganik, too, has many tasks. Seal skin must be prepared to make mukluks, the Eskimos' footwear. Seams are first marked with the teeth. Family measurements are reduced to the simplest terms. Two spans for father and the rest of the family in proportion. Trimming the soles offers an added attraction to the youngsters. The scraps make first class chewing. Pelea, the eldest daughter, takes a special interest in her boots, for she's soon to be married, and these will be added to her hope chest. When it's bedtime for baby, it's bedtime for the whole family. Lights out, and so to sleep. Tomorrow's sure to be another busy day. Something always hoped for, but seldom received, is a break in the weather. Whenever a clear day comes, it's a signal for an outburst of activity in the village. telling how long this break will last. What's to be done must be done quickly. Food supplies must be replenished. Drinking water is low. Wood boxes are empty. 
And so the dog teams are made ready as the different work parties prepare to carry out their appointed tasks. But at last, peace is restored, and the first team starts off across the snowfield. The beach party searching for fuel finds driftwood not only along the beach, but also some distance offshore, where the pressure of the pack ice has forced it to the surface. Reindeer are the Eskimos' cattle. And far inland, the village herd has just been located. After a steady diet of raw fish and seal blubber, fresh reindeer steaks will be most welcome. Meanwhile, miles from land, far out across the emptiness of the frozen sea, Koganek and his party have reached the fishing grounds. Out here in the silence, all seems calm and peaceful. And yet these men are actually on borrowed time. Should a blizzard catch them so far from the village, their chances of returning would be remote. Aware of the danger, but not alarmed by it, they go about their work methodically. These are needlefish, a great delicacy. They're eaten as is, spines and all. Fishing through the ice is an old Eskimo custom, and centuries ago, they invented some peculiar methods of angling which they still practice today. One of these is jiggle stick fishing. And all that's required is a barbless hook, a bright colored lure, a sinew line, and a limber wrist. On fishing expeditions like this, the puppies always tag along. Actually, it's part of their training for the hardships of the trail. But to the pups, it's better than a picnic. After all, there's no telling what a fellow might pick up if he's on his toes. <coughs> Suddenly, Koganek's weather sense warns of danger. Through his homemade eye shades, he scans the horizon. The storm is not far away and closing in fast. They may have waited too long. But for Koganek, there's still one final chore. From a nearby freshwater pond, he hurriedly gathers large blocks of ice to supply his family with drinking water.
As the blizzard closes in, he will be the last man in the village to find the warmth and safety of his underground home. Koganak's safe return is a festive occasion, and so tonight his family will celebrate over a delicious bowl of blueberry ice cream. This rare old recipe is well worth remembering. Take one bowl last summer's blueberries. Uh, not just any blueberries. They must be preserved in fish oil, which gives them a racy, slightly fermented flavor. Meanwhile, to one skillet of slowly simmering seal blubber, Add two heaping hands full raw reindeer tallow. Then pour this savory sauce into a large driftwood mixing bowl. Now add several tablespoons plain drifted snow and mix thoroughly and by hand. After all the ingredients are thoroughly blended, add the blueberries and fold in gently. Finally, clean utensils thoroughly and serve. This mess, uh, mixture, is called Akutak, the blueberry ice cream with the fish flavor. tangy, tasty, and much appreciated by young and old alike. But only if you're an Eskimo. Days pass, and weeks, and still the blizzard howls across the village. Such is the Arctic winter. The Eskimos call it Ukirak Tilak, the time of waiting. But finally there comes a night when the skies clear and a frosty moon heralds the coming of spring. For on this night an elaborate ceremony will take place. Of course everyone will attend, even the baby. is still well below zero. And so Chikoyak lines her mukluks with rags. To which Papa adds a generous padding of straw. To Pelea, the festival is just the place to show off her new and fetching spring ensemble. Makaluk waits impatiently as Papa at the last minute decides to go full dress. And so he simply turns his everyday clothes inside out to display its gorgeous lining of goose feathers. On this night, a current of excitement runs through the village. The sound of drums is heard and a muffled chanting of many voices. From all directions, the villagers make their way toward the community meeting house. On this night of nights, the villagers thank their gods for the passing of another winter, the coming of another spring. The masks represent the gods of the sky, the sea, and the land. To the god of the sea goes special praise, for he took only three lives this year, a small price for the bounty he gave.
people have no written history. All their tribal lore is preserved in these ceremonies. By mid-evening, however, all the gods have received their due, and now the fun begins. The tempo quickens, and the performers exchange their solemn masks for the grinning faces of comedy. Actually, these are caricatures of the villagers themselves, and the dancers spare no one in a round of good-natured ridicule. These are a happy people. And although the Eskimo possesses neither gold nor precious stones, nor indeed any worldly goods that anyone else would want. He does find treasure beyond price. He finds peace and happiness and contentment. <laughs> <laughs> 